Seltzer presents The Adventures of Ellery Queen. Tonight, the makers of Bromo Seltzer bring you another thrilling adventure with Ellery Queen, the celebrated gentleman detective in person. Ellery Queen again gives you a chance to match wits with him as he relates a new story of a crime he alone unraveled. And then, at the point where he was able to solve the mystery, he stops the play, gives you a chance to guess the criminal's name. In the studio tonight, we have as our guest Miss Anne Corio, glamorous screen and stage star, and Mr. Alfred D. McKelvey, prominent Eastern manufacturer. Miss Corio and Mr. McKelvey have accepted Ellery Queen's challenge to solve the mystery before the solution is revealed. And now, Ellery Queen, master detective and your host for the next half hour. Thank you, Ernest Chappell, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's story concerns the adventures Nicky and I had when a stool pigeon gave us incriminating evidence against Musso the Moose. I call it The Adventure of the Singing Rat. Inspector? Yeah, Look who's paying a visit to headquarters. The Singing Rat. Singing Rat? Ah, show him in, Vee. Always glad to see the rat. Enter, sir, rodent. Check, Sarge, yeah. Speedy, shut that door and keep it shut. Right. What's your song today, rat? Listen, Inspector, I got something fake, see? And nobody can hear me, huh? The rat's a little shaky, Inspector. He's got something for us. On Musso. On Musso? What is it, rat? Sing. Listen, Inspector Queen, I can tell you how to get the moose. But good, see? Musso the moose. Well, well. But you got to give me protection, Inspector. Put me in stir until this blows over. Come on, come on, Rod. What do you got? Tonight, see? Twelve shot. The moose will be in a parked car at the northwest corner of Broadway and Vesey Street. All you got to do, Inspector, is to hook what he's got in the upper right-hand pocket of his vest. I'll show that dirty... Vini, me around, huh? Put the singing rat in the cell. Book him on some charge. Make it look legitimate. Suspicion of petty larceny, and that's no lie. Orders, Inspector? Three men. Here at 11.30. Absolute secrecy. There mustn't be a leak. Maybe what's in that mobster's vest pocket is the evidence I've been looking for for five years. Why don't he show up, Moose? I don't like sitting in this park car. <laughs> you be like me, Kagai. Big businessman. Soft, nice, easy, relaxed. Yeah, Moose, yeah. But why do we got to meet his nibs on street corners? We're wide open, Kagai, Moose. you don't understand. That's the way you're a punk, and I'm a Moose of the Moose. He's important man. Sure, I can make him come up to the apartment like last week, but... He's taking a chance. If somebody she sees him... Hey, Moose, he, huh? that black sedan. It's the cop. Cop. Now keep your pants on, Kakai. You must have that car. Sit still. Kakai, no. Don't start nothing. I got him called the sergeant. Flint, flash the light on him. All right, step out, Moose. You too, Mike. Reach for a rod and you'll be angel food before you hit the sidewalk. Come on. Hello, sergeant. You is sore about something. Sure, we come out. Good evening, Moose. Oh, he's my old friend, Inspector Queen. Neither of them's healed, Inspector. Inspect. Every time you pull in the moose, you gotta let me go again. And you know getting the tired. Hold your arm time, Moose. Stand hmm? still and you won't be hurt. Flint, do that submachine gun to his back so he won't get ambitious. Hey, do you not, Inspector? What's the idea? All right, Billy. Put your hand in the upper right pocket of his vest and take out whatever's in there. My vest? You don't do that? I want my mouthpiece. All right. Take your hands out of my vest. Let me go. Nice, Murphy. There. Somebody, she's a squeal. I find out who. He's a dead man. I kill him. I kill him. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the beginning of our mystery. We'll be back in just a moment to tell you more, but first... Ernest Chappell. Friends, you like to save money, don't you? And you like fast relief from a common sick headache? <laughs> of course. But what's saving money got to do with that? 
Ah, uh, plenty, so listen closely. Right now at your drugstore, you can get the large 60 cent size bottle of Bromo Seltzer for only 39 cents. Now, any way you figure it, that's a saving of 20% or more. And talk about quick, effective relief. Uh, but I'll let Mr. Howard B. Abel of Cypressville, Pennsylvania, tell you about that. He writes, Whenever I get a common sick headache, I always take Bromo Seltzer. Because I found out many years ago that there's just nothing better. Recently, I won my wife over to Bromo Seltzer, too. One day, she had a common sick headache, and the preparation she usually took just didn't seem to help her. I persuaded her to let me fix her a Bromo Seltzer. Well, she was delighted at how quickly she got relief. You can be sure there's always a bottle of Bromo Seltzer in our home. Ah, uh, millions of folks feel just as you do, Mr. Abel. Which reminds me, you old users of Bromo Seltzer will want to get in on this wonderful special, too, but you must hurry. This offer is strictly limited, both as to time and quantity. So tomorrow, go to your druggist. Ask him for the regular, large, 60 cent size bottle of Bromo Seltzer. But pay him only 39 cents. Better still, get two bottles. One for your desk or locker, one for home use. And now let's join Ellery Queen and Nikki Porter as they visit Inspector Queen at headquarters the morning after the capture of Musso the Racketeer. What's up, Dad? Why the hurry call? Oh, Ellery. I didn't want you. I wanted Nikki. Oh, I see. Me, Inspector? This is so sudden. Would you act as my stenographer this morning, Nikki? My own man's home sick, and this is very confidential. Musso case. Give me a pad and a couple of pencils, Inspector, and I'll be silent, Susan herself. Dad, don't tell me you finally tied the moose up to the bankruptcy racket. I sure have. What on earth is the bankruptcy racket, Ellery? A cute little dodge to defraud unlucky business people. A oh? firm goes into bankruptcy. A crooked judge appoints some politician as receiver. A crooked appraiser undervalues the property magnificently. It goes for a song. And everyone involved in the racket, except the bankrupt and his creditors, makes a heap of crooked money. We've known about this ring for a long time, Nicky. Judge Lampson appoints the receiver, Phil Boyne. Boyne's a slick politician. Little lisping jerk by the name of Paul Ernie. He's the crooked appraiser. And a woman lawyer, Fanny Wicker, handles the legal end. All on the moose's payroll. But we've never been able to prove it. I see. Here right. comes Reedy now with a singing rat. Come in. The rat kicked us off. Right this way, brother rat. Inspector, Musso's out on bail. Keep your shirt on, rat. We couldn't keep him in a cell indefinitely at this early stage. But he knows I was made a sang, I tell you. He'll get me. He'll get nobody. Really show those four good citizens into my office. Yes, sir. I've been waiting for this a long, long time. In there, folks. Guard, quicker. Rat, get over there near the window and lie low. Yeah, okay. Ah, Judge Lampson. Come in, Miss Wicker. Mr. Boyne. Mr. Arnie. Lady, shut that door and see we're not interrupted. Oh, yes, sir. Inspector Green, what's the meaning of this high-handed procedure? Failing a member of the bench to your office like a felon. I'll explain in a moment, Your Honor. Miss Wicker, I believe we had the pleasure yesterday when you showed up in court with $50,000 for Musso's bail. Come on, Inspector. What have you got? You didn't ask me to your office today to admire my new shade of lipstick. Mmm, what a horsey woman. Quiet, Nicky. No. And Phil Boyne. Eh, don't see you down here very often. Well, I always say stay away from wine, women, and police headquarters if you want to keep out of trouble, eh, Inspector? Uh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Ernie. Man, is something wrong? You look sick. Can you praise the racket good, Ernie? No complaint, Inspector. In fact, today is my busy day. May be a lot busier before sundown, Mr. Arnie. Now, last night I arrested Musso the racketeer. In his vest pocket, I found a case full of cigarettes. Cigarettes? Case of cigarettes. Yes, mm. cigarettes. The Moose spoke a special brand. It bears monogram and gold leaf. Very swanky. The moose head. One of the monogram cigarettes in the Moose's case. In fact, this one on my desk here. Mm-hmm. Yes, Judge, here. Yeah? Yes, sir. That's it. That one's a very special cigarette. Not like the others in Musso's case. Looks like one of Musso's regular cigarettes to me. Does it, Counselor? Ellery, hand me that cigarette. Here you are, Dan. What is this, Mr. Barnum? <laughs> Greatest show on earth, son. Now, this cigarette looks like an ordinary Musso cigarette. But it isn't. It ends up plugged with little wads of tobacco, which are removable. See? In other words, it's hollow. Contain something. 
I wonder what it can be. Well, well. Ellery, what's that piece of paper tightly rolled up? A document of some sort, Nikki. This document, Musso's handwriting, is a payroll report. What? Quote, paid to Judge Eustace F. Lampton, $19,000 for appointing Phil Boyne, receiver in bankruptcy. Well, I see here. Well, and it's got your signature, Judge Lampton. It's, it's, it's that right. 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 black in my good name. I don't even know Musso. Inspector. I've seen the judge go up to the Moses apartment only last week. So that's why this notorious thief and police informer is in your office, Inspector. It, it was the rat. He's the one who sang. Inspector, let's talk this over. I've got some influence, you know. Have you, Boyne? You're going to need it. Let's cut the salami. What else have you got, Inspector Queen? Your signature and receipt, Miss Wicker. Bill Boyne's and Ernie's. That's no, no, let's see that paper. Oh, no, Judge. You'd like to get your hands on this little piece of paper, wouldn't you? <laughs> Itchy fingers, Counselor? Mr. Ernie? Mr. Boyne? Yeah. We'll just remove temptation. Roll the paper up again. Tuck it back into this hollow cigarette. Like this. Put back the four tobacco plugs and... We've got the evidence all ready for the district attorney. Well, I don't have to do the thing. Well, I've been in politics case. a long time, I... Inspector, and I've seen a lot of wise cops come and go. Prove it. Take us into court. What do you intend to do, Inspector? I want Musso. The DA will go easy on any one of you who gives evidence to break Musso's power and put him out of circulation. It's up to you four. Oh, oh, I want to that. Uh, Ellery, I... what's the matter with the singing rat? He's backing away from the window. Hey, what's the matter? Guy in that building across the street's aiming a rifle at me. Through the window. He's going to shoot. Hey, boy, save me. Don't grab me, you rat. Oh, oh, oh. Billy, that building opposite, man with a rifle. Where? Billy, get that sniper. Who got it? Mr. Boyne, Sergeant. He's hurt. Let me through here, please. Bill, Bill Boyne. I couldn't help it. I see the rifle. I duck. I grab his spine so he couldn't start him right. He must have been the moose. He's trying to kill me for square. Murder attempt in my office. Boyne. Boy, where were you hit? I don't know. I call a ambulance. When you call a doctor, I'm shot. I'm telling you. I see. I see, boy. Where does it hurt? Here's the bullet hole and it's coat pad. Oh, but I don't see. Die. I tell you, bullet die. It's very badly, Ellen. Can't find the wound, Nicky. Not a sign of blood. Now, stop crying, boy. What are you crying for? Plain funk, Dad. Nervous shock. Listen, boy. You're all right. You're not hurt. Not even a scratch. Thank goodness. But the bullet went right through his coat, Marshal. <laughs> through his coat, Sergeant. Through this cigarette case in his breast pocket and smack up against this steel vest he's wearing. No. What? A steel vest? Son. Yes, Dad, see? Here's the vest and here's the flattened slug. All he got was a chest bruise. Now get up, boy. Stop acting like a baby. Ooh. I'm shaking like a custard pudding. <laughs> Look at the rat, Miss Porter. If he was milk, he'd be butter. Give me a butt, somebody. Give me a butt, will you? Here you are, Mr. Rat. Me too, Queen. Thanks. I can use one. I guess we all can, Counselor. Mr. Boyne? No, no, I don't want any. I'll have one of those cigarettes, Mr. Queen. Of course, Judge. Mr. Ernie? Uh, thanks. Dan? Nicky? But yes. Thanks, thanks, son. Now let's get back to cases. Are you good citizens going to testify against Musso or aren't you? Miss Wicker? I can't think straight now, Inspector. Give us a little time. Time, Counselor. Sir, I can give you my answer now. Sure, don't be hasty. Talk this over. Okay. I'll give you people just two days to make up your mind. No longer. All right, Billy. Let him go. This way out, Your Honor. Come on, come on. Oh, I... Billy, any report on that building across the street? No luck, Inspector. By the time the boys got there, the guy that fired the rifle had taken a powder. No, I'll never hear the end of this. Dad, the singing rat. He's gone. Huh? Billy, where'd the rat go? I don't know, Inspector. I didn't say him. I guess Brother Rat decides police headquarters isn't as safe as he'd think it. Fool, now Mush will get him sure. Billy, send out an alarm. Bring the rat in. All right, Inspector. Dan, I'd advise you to be very careful about this evidence on your desk. Put this fake cigarette in a safe place. Don't worry, son. I'm putting the Moose's monogram butt with that payroll report inside in the thickest vault at headquarters. You better do it now, Dan. There are five desperate people. Judge Lamson, Attorney Wicker, Appraiser Ernie politician Boyne and Musso himself who will stop at nothing to get their hands on it. Seems to me we practically live at police headquarters these days, Ellery. 
What's the occasion for this visit to the inspector's office? Don't you remember, Nikki? The deadline Dad gave Musso's four distinguished co-workers is up this afternoon. Well, why should that make you look droopy? This isn't your case. Anyway, even if it were, there's no mystery about it. I know, I know. Just the same, Nikki, there's something wrong. It's been bothering me for days. Can't put my finger on it. You and your imagination. Here's the inspector's office. Isn't Daly there, Eva? We're fine, I'm blasted. Oh, hey, Nikki. Anything new on the Moose case, Inspector? Have you heard from Judge Lanson yet or the others, Dad? Oh, to hear any minute now. You can only agree to testify against that slippery mobster. Yes? Annie Wickers here, Inspector. Who's his mouthpiece? Send the counselor in. Something tells me this is good news. Ah, Miss Wicker. Well, has that smart legal brain of yours looked over all the angles of the corner you people are in? You win, Inspector. Ah. We'll cooperate with the DA, give what evidence we can against Musso, provided we're protected, and the DA makes the deal. That's very smart. Look at the inspector's face, Ellery. He looks positively blissful. There's something wrong, Nicky. Something wrong. Oh, as you see that way, Miss Wicker. You're here as spokesman for the whole group? All except Judge Lanson. His honor is going to fight, Inspector. That's the worst decision his honor ever made. Yeah. So the moose is going down with the count at last. Out on bail, is he? Not for long. Excuse me. Yes? Inspector, where are we? Really, I've been combing the city for you. Where are you? Central Park. Westman. Central Park. What are you doing in Central Park? Sharing nuts with the squirrel? Now, listen, Inspector. It's about the moose. The moose? What's about the moose? A park cop just found him under a bush with a bullet in his brain. <laughs> What, Nikki? Ellery, Queen, what's the matter with you? Uh, nothing, Nikki, nothing. It's just that I can't get it out of my mind. Get what out of your mind? Oh, your imagination again. Meanwhile, that racketeer is lying here in the park murdered. Yes. Oh, Dad. Well? Moose got it in the brain, Ellery. He rounded up his gang with a deaf, dumb, and blind. What was Musso doing in Central Park, I wonder? Obviously, Nikki, he had an appointment with his murderer. You see here? Bodies lying behind a bush in this clump of trees, and no signs of its being dragged. They were arguing here. Now, oh, Sergeant, did you find the gun? Yeah, Maestro. It's the Moose's own rod. One chamber's empty. They struggled over Moose's gun, Ellery, and the other gentleman won. He's no gentleman. Dad, how long has the Moose been lying here dead? Doc Patty says he was bumped off sometime today. He didn't die right away, so Doc says there's no telling exactly how long he lingered. He'd have been murdered any time this morning or early afternoon. Grab it. Have to check alibis. Dad, look at this. What, son? I just found it under the body. This hollow cigarette with the moose monogram on it. A hollow one? Like the one we got at headquarters? Isn't there anything in it, Ellen? No, it's empty. Dad, are you sure the cigarette with the document is safe at Center Street? This looks like the identical casing. It can't be, Ellery. I locked the evidence up myself. Just the same, Dad. Let's go back to headquarters and check up. Hurry, Dad. Oh, hurry. I suppose Mr. Right, could have had two. There. Didn't I tell you, Ellery? Here's the Moose's dummy cigarette, just as I left it in the safe. Let's see it, Dad. Dad, this isn't a dummy. It's a real cigarette? Tobacco, clear through. My evidence. But I locked the dummy monogram cigarette in my safe two days ago, son. You only thought it was the dummy, Dad. The switch must have been made before you locked this cigarette in your safe. One of those crooks substituted a real moose cigarette for the hollow one in your office two days ago, Inspector. Exactly, Dad. After showing the document to those people in your office... You replaced it in the hollow dummy and put the dummy on your desk, remember? Oh, yes. They all kept wandering around the office. Yes. Would have taken only a second to make the switch of cigarettes. Say, I know when the switch was made. When the rat screamed that somebody was going to shoot him. Right, Dad. And one of them came prepared to make the exchange. But which one? They all had cigarettes with them, Sergeant. The judge smoked incessantly. So did Miss Wicker and Mr. Ernie. 
We know Boyne had cigarettes. His cigarette case was pierced by that rifle bullet. So any of them could have made the switch two days ago. But but how did the stolen one get under Musso's body in Central Park, Ellis? The thief must have brought it with him today to his appointment with his victim. Of course. Oh, but I don't understand why he knocked the moose off, Maestro. It's not hard to reconstruct, Sergeant. The thief, in possession of the vital evidence, wanted money from Musso. Money in return for not handing that evidence back to the police. Probably intended to milk them all dry, one after the other, and start with the racketeer. Yeah, and then figured he'd destroy the evidence. All right. So whoever stole that dummy cigarette in my office the other day is the killer of Musso. But who? Looks like a tough one to me, Ellery. Tough? I don't think so, Dad. Now, Ellery, don't tell me you know... Yes, Nikki. I know who stole the dummy cigarette and murdered the moose. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the mystery. And I hope a solution as well. Nikki, will you be good enough to introduce our guest armchair detectives for this evening? Well, Ellery, our first guest tonight is Ann Corio, glamorous stage and screen star who is currently making a record-breaking tour of vaudeville theaters from coast to coast. Miss Corio returns to Hollywood soon for her next film, Sarong Girl. Our second guest is Alfred D. McKelvey, prominent Eastern manufacturer and amateur radio detective. You know, Ellery... Mr. McKelvey's hobby is beating fictional radio detectives to the solution. So you'd better watch out. <laughs> All right, Ellery. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. Miss Corio, who is the criminal? Well, I, um, it's rather difficult, but I think the rat uh, stole the cigarette that he has been living in terror of Musso, and uh, he did it to bribe him. Have you That's any clues? Nice. No, except that uh, when the gun was shot off, he seemed to know just what was happening, and he uh, made quite sure that the bullet hit uh, Byrne and not himself. And I think that was all set up so that he could uh, switch the cigarette. Thank you, Miss Corio. Mr. McKelvey, who do you think is the criminal? Well, I've missed some easier guesses than this, so I'll probably miss this. <laughs> But uh, I guess that Phil Barnes did it because of the fact that he showed up uh, in the uh, office opposite the uh, sharpshooter with a vest on so that there, if there was any poor shooting, he was one fellow that wasn't going to be hit. He also happened to have a cigarette case in his pocket, so he could have been the man to make the exchange in the park. And uh, being a politician, he probably knew his way out in the final analysis. Right. Well, thank you, Miss Corio and Mr. McKelvey. You'll know in just a moment how successful you were as armchair detectives. But first, here's Ernest Chappell, a very reasonable man indeed. Certainly I'm reasonable, Ellery. For instance, when I tell you folks to get two bottles of Bromo Seltzer, one to keep at home, the other where you work, I have two mighty good reasons. Firstly, you never know when a common sick headache will affect you, but you can depend on Bromo Seltzer to help you feel better fast. For Bromo Seltzer fights headache three ways, acts on head, nerves, and stomach. You get effective relief. Quickly feel more like your old self again. Reason number two for buying two bottles? Right now, there's a wonderful special on Bromo Seltzer. The regular large 60-cent size bottle for only 39 cents. Now, that means you save 20% or more. But remember, this offer is strictly limited, both to time and quantity. So act at once. <laughs> Was it Judge Lamson? Or that mouthpiece and skirt, Fanny Wicker? That lifting little appraiser, Ernie. No. The thief of the evidence, and therefore the killer of Musso, was Phil Boyne. Boyne? That politician? The one that got hit by the rifle bullet by mistake? But uh, how do you know it was Boyne, Ellery? The clue in this case is psychological, but it's as incontestable as a fingerprint. Consider the situation in your office, Dad, two days ago. Musso, or one of his henchmen, in trying to kill a singing rat, fired a shot that struck Phil Boyne by mistake. How did Boyne react? Well, like an old lady. Got his start. Yes. Boyne was so shocked by his narrow escape from death, so unnerved, that he blubbered like a scared child. Yet when, at the height of excitement, I offered him a cigarette, 
He refused it. That's right. He did. The judge, the rat, Counselor Wicker, Ernie, even you, Dad, and Nicky were all so shaken by the murderous attack that you gratefully accepted a cigarette to soothe your nerves. Yet Boyne, the man most immediately involved, the man who had actually been struck by the bullet, although unhurt, the man who threw a fit of hysterics, Boyne refused to smoke. Conclusion? Phil Boyne is not a smoking man. Phil Boyne doesn't smoke at all. If he were a smoker, even a light smoker, he would have grabbed at a cigarette in his condition. But Ellery, if Boyne isn't a smoker, why does he carry a cigarette case around with him? He did that day. You said yourself it was pierced by the rifle bullet. Yes, Nicky. Why did Boyne, a non-smoker, carry a cigarette case? Since it wasn't because he smoked, then that case and the cigarettes in it must have served an entirely different purpose. I see it now, son. Yes, Dad. We know one of Musso's specially monogrammed cigarettes was substituted for the hollow one with the evidence in it. Therefore, the thief must have come to your office with a cigarette he'd stolen from Musso in advance. In other words, the thief came prepared to make a switch of cigarettes if the opportunity arose. And which of the four suspects did come prepared? Obviously, the man who carried a cigarette case but didn't smoke. Dad... If you'll nab Phil Boyne right away, there's a good chance he still has that document with its precious evidence on him. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the solution to the mystery. I want to thank Miss Ann Corio and Mr. Alfred McKelvey for appearing as guest armchair detectives this evening. And we have for both Miss Corio and Mr. McKelvey a personal gift from Bromo Seltzer. Also, an autographed copy of my latest mystery anthology, Sporting Blood, and a subscription to Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Ellery, I'm a man who comes to the point. Chappie, so am I. <laughs> I know at that point you're going to make, and my answer is you'll have to wait a minute to hear what next week's story is about. Well, it so happens that I can fill that minute with some mighty important information. You can take it straight from our educated Bromo Seltzer train, friends. The time to try Bromo Seltzer is right now. Listen. Save money by now. Yes, buy Bromo Seltzer now and you'll save money. 20% or more. For right now, your druggist is offering the large 60 cent sized bottle of Bromo Seltzer for only 39 cents. This offer is good for a limited time only, so act at once. Remember, Bromo Seltzer fights headache three ways. These three ways. Quick relief from headache pain. Fast help for jumpy nerves. Quick help for upset stomach. So don't be satisfied with anything that does less for you than Bromo Seltzer. Use it only as directed on the label. For frequent or persistent headache, see your doctor. For quick, effective relief from common sick headaches, get tried and true Bromo Seltzer. And be sure to ask for the large 60 cent size bottle, now selling at the special low price of only 39 cents. Save money by now! All right, Sherlock Holmes, come on, what's on tap for next week? Funny you should call me that, Chappie. How uh, so? Well, because next week I'm going to tell about a case I had which will remind you of one that baffled the great Sherlock himself. It's about a man who goes into his house for an umbrella and disappears. I call my case The Adventure of Mr. Short and Mr. Long. Be sure to listen next Thursday at this same time. And don't forget the other great Romo Seltzer show friends, Vox Pop, the show that travels America. Next Monday, Vox Pop travels to Bowling Field in Washington. Fox Johnson and Warren Hull will interview men of our Army Air Force. Consult your local paper for the time and station. Music for the Adventures of Ellery Queen is by Charles Paul. <laughs>